Hi, my name's Alex. I work for Rode Microphones. Rode Microphones make the wonderful video mic. Um, but today we're not really talking about microphones so much as what you do once you've recorded something with them. This video is going to be as practical a primer as I can make for how to use EQ and compression tools, as well as denoising tools, in order to take audio that you've recorded and sweeten and polish it how to use these mysterious tools in order to get good sounding audio. Now I want this to be as simple and practical as possible and in it I'm going to use Adobe Premiere but at the end I'm going to show this package called Isotope RX which is completely separate and a very specific audio package but I really strongly recommend it. I've made lots and lots of videos in my life and I've used RX extensively it saved my bacon more times than I care to admit. So firstly, let's talk about EQ and compression. Um, we are in Adobe Premiere Pro, um, and I have got some audio of yours truly, that's me, from a podcast that I recorded, um, but could be a video as well. It's kind of just an example uh, to talk about. And the audio is fairly well recorded. I recorded it with this microphone actually, but without the kind of processing that you're actually hearing on the, my microphone right now. EQ and compression used correctly is very, very much like using brightness and contrast on video and images. EQ and compression are the two most important tools that you can use to take audio that is pretty good and make it spot on. Of course, it's not a perfect nor an exact science, and there is a lot of human judgment at play. The first thing that you need to know is that sound is composed of frequencies, and there is a spectrum. Just as in video, there is a spectrum of dark to light. In sound, there is a spectrum of low bass sounds to high Tweety Bird sounds, you know, on one end. And the human voice occupies a curve on that spectrum. Different voices will have slightly different curves, but in a general sense, the human voice occupies a limited part of that spectrum. And every voice is a bit different. Every voice will have slightly different curves. They will have slightly more sound at different frequencies, both depending on the person and depending on how and where they were recorded. So this is important because what an EQ does is allow us to rebalance that spectrum. If our voice is sounding a bit thin, we can use EQ to try and put a bit of that fullness back in to a limited extent, but to an extent. And if it's sounding too bright, we can use EQ to try and tame that brightness. Or if you have touched your microphone and created a bumping sound, you can use EQ to try and remove that bump. So there's corrective things that EQ can do, and there are also tonal things that it can do. Before I show you EQ, there's one very, very important tool that will mean that you never go far wrong with any of these things. And that is having some reference audio. By that, I mean that you have perhaps a video saved, a bookmarked video or something on your hard drive that serves as a reference to help remind you of what audio is supposed to sound like in a good example. So this is probably going to be perhaps a bit of professionally recorded like news audio that you know is good or a bit of documentary or it could it could be anything, but it would serve as a professionally recorded, mixed and polished example of dialogue that you like the sound of. And what you can do is whenever you are making judgments on the audio that you're adjusting, and if especially, trust me, if you've been doing it for hours and hours in a day, you can lose all objectivity. You'll be able to refer back to your example of professionally recorded audio and just play that and then play your session here and you'll be able to make a judgment. So having reference is a hugely valuable tool. Okay, so I'm gonna use the parametric equalizer in Premiere and I'm gonna drag it onto the file. So 
if I bring up the parametric EQ, you can see that there are a bunch of controls. I'm going to hit play and we'll have a quick listen to what the audio sounds like by itself. With regard to like the studio as an instrument, how, how do you keep a, a studio where you have every option at your fingertips? How do you make it usable? Okay, so it sounds okay. It's maybe a little bit sort of lacking in detail, but there's lots and lots of stuff to take in here. One good example of this parametric equalizer is it's showing the waveform as we play. So I'll mute this and hit play. You can see that it's showing us the frequency spectrum. So what I was saying before about low sounds to high sounds, that's what this is. That's low sounds, that's high sounds. And you can see that kind of all of the sound spectrum is jiggling around. But in a nutshell, you can take my word for it that everything below about 80 on the sound spectrum, which refers to 80 hertz, a particular frequency, all of that is nothing to do with my voice. It's just audio garbage that you can get rid of. Interestingly, if you have a video mic made by those wonderful people that I work for at Rode, um, there is a little dial on a switch on the back, which looks like a little sort of scoop. I got this the right way around, scoop like that. And that's a high pass filter. What that will do is cut out everything below 75 to 80 hertz, depending on the mic you have. But what this means is that we can turn on a high pass filter. And if I put that to about 80 hertz here, what that's going to do is going to, it's going to cut out all that rumble. So if I then play this back, you're probably not able to hear too much of the difference, very much depending on your headphones and your ears. But take my word for it, that is stuff that you do not want to have. So you can very safely high pass dialogue at 80 hertz and potentially even higher. Just trust your ears. If it sounds thin and tinny, it is. If you're using reference audio correctly, you may hear that there's a kind of like tones and sort of modes, like a kind of a slight sort of almost ring to a person's voice that, that annoys you or like a boominess, at a certain tone. And you can see that the EQ is comprised of bands, the sort of um, corrective sort of um, handles that I can get hold of. And I'm able to boost or cut frequencies at a particular point, depending on how what I want to do. And I have a, a limited amount of bands here to make corrections with. But the golden rule, if there is one, is try not to overdo things and try not to make major, major changes. If you're finding that you have to make huge changes of more than three or four decibels, which is the scale of volume, a decibel is the, the sort of how much louder or quieter it is. And then obviously the frequency is where it uh, is, whether it's a low or a high sound. Try to only make small adjustments to make a kind of slight overall balance change. If you're having to make huge corrective issues, it's a bit of a red flag that there's a bigger problem with your audio. Maybe you should be using a different take. If you have the luxury of re-recording it, it might be a possibility. But the way to sort of get a sense of what to do is this. What I will do is I will play back the audio and you'll see me kind of moving the EQ around and I'm boosting ridiculously. And I'm doing that in order to sort of find the kind of tones that come out. And I'm going to use boost to find them and then I'm going to cut them. So let's have a little listen. Every option at your fingertips, how do you make it usable? Hear that boom? With regard to like the studio as an instrument. Sounds how, very nasal there. How do you keep a, a studio where you have every option at your fingertips? How do you make it usable with you, regard you can hear up there it's all the kind of airiness so what i could do is if i want to take uh, get a little bit of the boom out of it i would cut around about well maybe here maybe more of the nasal quality and then if i wanted to inject a little bit of kind of brightness and sparkle i would think i would do so up there that's kind of where it was and then there's a, a bit of a sort of helping hand rule with regard to how to boost and how to cut and that general rule is boost wide, cut narrow. Now, what I mean by that is 
wide and narrow refers to the fact that these little like ski slopes you can change their width and you do so with the Q control. Now, um, there's probably a shortcut here, but I'll just adjust down here. So Q or width is how wide that particular little band is. And so boost wide means have a wide curve to the boost and cut narrow means literally that have a narrow corrective cut down here. Because what you'll tend to find is if you're boosting narrow frequencies, you create this kind of weird ringing tone that sounds very artificial. But actually you can cut specific frequencies quite precisely. And as long as you don't massively overdo it, it's harder to hear that that has been done. It, you just hear the correction. You don't hear a sort of a natural scoop, if that makes sense. Okay, so I've just played it back and I've been making a few little changes um, and kind of just listening and reacting. And I've been trying not to overdo it. And what I've also been doing is turning the sound on and off as I preview so I can objectively hear the before and after and really get a sense of if I've made an improvement that I like. With regard to like the studio as an instrument, how, how do you keep a, a studio where you have every option at your fingertips? How and so basically I've been through and I've made some changes and I've just boosted the low end a little bit. I did like the sound of it with a bit more kind of fullness. And I've also lifted the highs a little bit just to put some airiness back into it. And what you can see is um, I've made only a few sort of a couple of degrees of dB of change. There's not very much change that's occurred. And I think that's just the main thing to stress. There's no kind of hard and fast formula to how to make corrections to EQ other than to understand what the tools do, which is that they boost and cut frequencies. You can use them correctively if you hear things that you don't like. But the main thing is to use reference audio and refer to it and make an objective judgment as to whether you think you've made an improvement as a result. But there isn't just like a magic template for how to EQ audio because every bit of audio is very specifically different. You just can't do that. OK, then compression. So I'm going to pull up the Tube modeled compressor, which is a uh, compressor that I've used lots in this in Premiere, which is a very simple one and is just has the most basic controls that a compressor has. So what does a compressor do and how does it work? Well, in a nutshell, a compressor is there to even out the volume differences in your audio. And it does this by making the louder parts of your audio quieter on demand and automatically so that the overall level volume of your audio is kind of evened out. And the reason that you would want that is you don't want someone to be watching your audio, your video clip back and having to adjust the volume knob throughout the video. You want it to be um, as consistent as possible. And so the tube model compressor is a, a very, very basic compressor that has these kind of uh, common controls that most compressors do. Those are threshold, ratio, attack, release, and output gain. Um, now, how it all works one by one. So I said that a compressor, will, what it will do is it will turn down the volume of your audio on demand. It is literally like a volume knob. It's just like a virtual volume knob. And instead of there being a human to control a volume knob, you're programming a machine to control a volume knob for you. And so the threshold is literally the threshold, the point at which you're saying to the compressor, I want you to turn this down. So it's saying that this is the kind of point at which we're going to do some turning down. Um, and if I play back my audio, okay. you will see that there is a meter here. With regard to like the studio is an instrument and it's hitting minus 12, which is a good level to be recording. It's just about on the money. And what I could do is if I want to compress this, I move it beyond minus 12 so that the threshold is lower than that volume. But what you do not see is any compression. And that's because I need to adjust the ratio. So the ratio in a nutshell is just the amount, how severely it will turn down the volume knob. And so if I put this up to something relatively modest, like two, a, 
a studio where you have every option at your fingertips. How do you make, you can see that this little red indicator comes up to say yeah. it's reducing the volume by this much. With regard to like the studio is an instrument. And then the question is what is attack and release? All those are, are the way in which it is turned down. So imagine the ha virtual hand is turning the volume knob. Attack is how fast it gets down to the level that it wants to, the, the most it's going to turn down. And then the release is once it returns back above the threshold, how fast does it return to the position it was at originally. So it's like the speed of the hand adjusting the controls. What you can find with compressors is when you overdo them, there's this kind of intense pumping sort of sound. The key is use your ears, mute it on and off, and use reference audio in order to check whether the changes you're making are good or bad. And so very quickly to talk about output gain, there is a really important other thing to mention, which is the overall level of your video. Now, I am going to assume, and this is an assumption that you're outputting your video for YouTube. YouTube has a loudness standard that it wants your videos to be. And to cut a very, very big subject into as nutshellish a way as possible, um, you can Google loudness wars and uh, target levels for YouTube audio uh, to learn more about this. But the long and short of it is there is an audio level YouTube would prefer you to submit at. And Premiere Pro has a really, really good tool called Loudness Radar. YouTube will want your target loudness to be minus 14 LKFS or LUFS. They are apparently, I'm told, the same thing. Um, and so if I play back this audio, you can see with this tool, it's showing me the levels that it is outputting and it's creating this sort of um, loudness radar literally here. And what I'll do is I'll adjust the compressor and I'll check to see if I am hitting about minus 14 on the loudness radar. And I know that my compression is helping me get to the target level. Studio is an instrument. How how do you keep a a studio where you have every option at your fingertips how do you make it usable with regard to like the studio is an instrument how how do you keep a a studio where you have every option at so I'm kind of sounding a bit fuller and um, I kind of like, I mean, I like very compressed audio, I must say, but that's a personal taste thing. But you can see I'm a little bit off on the loudness radar. And what I could then do is just come in here and just increase the output gain, keeping an eye on the meters here as well. At your fingertips, how do you make it usable? A studio where you have every option at your fingertips, how do you make it usable? Okay, and so now I've got it to a point where the radar is starting to hit about minus 14 and not going over very much, but kind of that's the target volume it's hitting, which is to say I'm about right. It's good to not have it so that the compressor is acting all the time, is always punching down on your audio. Try and use these things as sparingly as possible and just listen to your reference audio to ensure that you're not overdoing things. I know those sound, that sounds quite vague, but the answer is because there's not necessarily, there aren't particular settings that I can say that you have to use. The main point is understanding how the tools work. The threshold is the point at which you want to, to start turning things down. The ratio is how much you'll turn it down by, and then it will be adjusting the output gain to compensate. Those are all dependent on your audio, how dynamic and soft and loud it was, um, and you know how loudly it was recorded overall. Um, so they're sound specific, but I hope that helps a little bit. Now let's talk about sort of denoising and kind of disaster situations, because I think if there's a golden rule in audio, the golden rule of audio is buy the best microphone you can afford. Of course, it could well be a Rode microphone, but whatever microphone you can afford and put it as close as possible to the speaking subject. That's how you get the best possible sound in all situations being closer will almost certainly improve the result and give you less problems, less EQ and compression correction that you may have to do in order to make things sound acceptable. 
But what happens if you've not had that luxury and, and for whatever reason you've had to record in a noisier environment? Well, um, I want to just quickly talk about a couple of, of tools that you can use. OK, so I'm going to bring in this piece of audio that I recorded. Now, um, this was an interview that I did um, and it was in a kind of lobby way uh, to a, a big office building. And so you can hear that there's the person talking and I was pretty close. I was as close, you know, not like two or three feet away, but there's just so much ambient noise. Have a listen to this. But, um, it is extremely um, performant, I would say, in that it's snappy and fast. Um, you can run multiple songs. at the same time. So you can hear that there's this kind of background noise. There's the chatter from people. And is there a way that we can get rid of this? Well, so there are tools that we can use. Now, one of which is a audio gate or an expander, which is kind of like a compressor. But instead of it being where a compressor will turn down audio when it reaches a certain level, what a gate will do is it will turn down the audio when it goes below a certain level so that if I stop talking the gate will go down completely and create complete silence or partial silence when I've stopped speaking but I must say that gates tend not to be fantastic at this it's not a brilliant way of solving the problem and I'm more interested in denoisers that are specifically designed to solve this particular problem, which do so in a more complex way than a gate can. They use spectral content, the sort of frequency spectrum, and they get more deeply into the sound to try and fix the issue. And so there actually is one built in, which is called denoise. So if I put denoise on here um, and go to edit, you can see that I have some very, very simple controls to um, choose the amount of processing that I want to occur. Um, and there is also a tool here to focus on certain parts of the sound. And what I'll do is I'll just hit play and I will just adjust this a little bit. And let's listen to what it does. It is extremely um, performant, I would say, in that it's snappy and fast. Um, you can run multiple songs at the same time, switch between songs like that, where in other applications it takes forever to unload every plugin, mm. to re-instantiate all the plugins. It's just an example. It feels extreme. So you can hear as I increase the effect, and there's really nothing to teach here. It's just you just turn the effect up. You can hear it doing its magical stuff. And so it's it's listening to the whole sound spectrum and it's it's having a go at trying to reduce what it doesn't think is human speech. And it does a really good job. Like these tools are wonderful. They are so much better than gates. But one thing that I'm, I will instruct you as a person who has done this a great deal is to say, just be very cautious not to overdo the effect. It's tempting to think of it as a magic bullet. But what you will hear is there is a kind of swimming sort of like tinkly musical sound to when it is overdone. It is extremely um, performant, I would say, in that it's snappy and fast. Um, you can... And so the problem is that then the correction almost becomes distracting. As a general rule, if you can just minimize problems, that's often better than solving them completely. Get them so that they are less distracting so that the person can just focus on the dialogue. And at the end of the day, if the video is shot in a lobby, it's acceptable there'd be some background noise. You don't want the cure to be worse than the problem itself. OK, so this is Isotope RX-8. Now, I'm going to sound a little bit like a shill for Isotope and I work for Rode. Let me be very clear. Uh, I'm not getting paid by Isotope, um, but I want to bring this up because this piece of software is probably one of the most important things in my toolkit. What RX has allowed me to do is save audio from otherwise insoluble um, situations where I've, for whatever reason, mistakes have been made or that there's problems or that you've had to make do with less than perfect shooting scenarios. I've been able to rescue audio that I did not think was rescuable. And as well, things that I thought were as recorded as well as I possibly could. RX has consistently enabled me to elevate them. So I really strongly recommend it. Now, there are a couple of versions, by the way. There is an Elements, much more affordable Elements version, which has 
the denoising algorithm that I will show you in here. Because in a nutshell, this has denoising a bit like in Premiere, but what I would say is that the RX denoising sounds far superior. So the module is called Voice Denoise, and what I'll do is I'll just hit play, and we'll use the same bit of audio, and I'll apply the reduction amount. Very simple, you just turn up a dial, and you can kind of hear what the voice denoise does. Yeah, basically. And then you have a full feature DAW with all its plugins and instruments. Um, it is extremely um, performant, I would say, in that it's snappy and fast. Um, you can run multiple songs at the same time, switch between songs like that, where in other applications it takes forever to unload every plugin, to reinstate so all the plugins. It's just an example. It feels extremely snappy. Yeah. So it's very, very smooth. You're not getting a kind of tinkling sort of weirdness that you get with um, the Premiere Pro version of the same kind of effect. Performant. It's far more usable at more extreme settings. And there's one more denoising thing I just want to show you quickly, which is Dialog Isolate, which is kind of a more advanced version of the sort of Dialog denoiser. Just so you can hear kind of what, what does the more, more advanced version sound like. There's literally, I have the ability to adjust Dialog in relation to noise. So I could actually turn noise up if I wanted, but obviously I'm going to turn it down. So you listen to the result. Um. But on the other hand, in a, in a, in a very satisfying, relieving way, um, simpler, easier to use, mm. faster, snappier. Again, these are all paid for, they're all more expensive, but just know these tools exist um, because they may well save your bacon. And to that end, I just want to end on one final issue, which is echo. You know, the sound of when you've got a person that is... Um, you know, in a room and it sounds roomy and that comes from having a microphone too far away. Um, and what we've got here is, remember my earlier where I was working on my own voice, I've got um, the person I was speaking to was speaking through a laptop. Now, I didn't have any choice as to whether I could get them to record with a mic. It was just that or no interview. So it's a perfect example of where you've only got this, as, this is the only option of how I've been able to record their audio and there's echo on it. What do I do? So let's have a quick listen to um, the sound. Let's hear what it sounds like. Yeah, that's great. And there's a there's a lot to unpack there because it's 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 by volition. It's it's very very deliberate. So can you hear that echo? You can hear that he is in a room. He's in a kind of medium sized room with quite hard walls. Yeah, that's great. And there's a there's a lot to unpack there because just like this echo now. While I am about to show you an amazing tool for fixing this problem, I just want to say, and, and no matter what, this is probably the hardest problem in audio to deal with. Like echo is just a pig. It's the one that you can't really fix. But uh, I'm going to illustrate here that there are tools that can mitigate it even so. And so the tool is D-Reverb. Uh, so if I select this bit of audio here and then just hit learn, then the program analyzes the audio and tries to understand the echo profile. And then I can hit preview and adjust the effect. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And there's a, there's a lot to unpack there because it's, it's, it's by volition. It's, it's very, very. Do you hear that when it went from inside to outside? So I'll play it again and I'll turn it on and off. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And there's a, there's a lot to unpack there because it, that's great. Yeah, that's great. And there's a there's a lot to unpack there because it's 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 by volition. It's it's very very. It's very very good, is what it is. That's great. And again, I may sound like I'm shilling for this company, and that's because I am because I need this tool, and this is the tool that fixes the problem. And if nothing else, it's just something that you know that you can buy if you need to. The cost of investing in a program may well be worth it um, for the sake of it saving a paid for project. So, so that's it for audio editing. Main point, get the microphone as close as you possibly can. That will solve most problems. You've got EQ to sweeten and to correct sort of audio issues. You have compression to even out the volume. 
And then you have denoising and even de-reverb and other tools, um, some built into Premiere, but I highly recommend Isotope RX as a kind of, if you have bigger problems that can't be solved, at least you know that tools like this exist. So I just hope you don't need to use them, but do lots of tests, uh, experiment, and always remember to have reference audio to help you not go too far wrong. That's it. Thank you very much for watching and good luck out there.